Welcome to Göteborg Film Festival. My name is Jonas Holmberg and I'm the artistic director of the festival and I'm sitting here on the stage of uh, the Cinema Draken, the main premiere venue of the festival. Today it's unfortunately empty due to the COVID-19 situation, but I'm happy because I'm not here alone. I'm very proud to be sitting here with the recipient of this year's Honorary Dragon Award, Ruben Östen. Hello. Hey. Hello. Very welcome. Thank you. Um, you're in the middle of editing Triangle of Sadness, yeah. your, your new film. Um, we will talk a little bit more about that later, but just to check in, how is everything going? Uh, everything is going well, or it go it's going in the way that it's always going when you're in an editing process. You, you have like peaks and you have deep, deep bottom valleys <laughs> where you're dumping in the project. But uh, So it's going up and down like that. Uh, but it's at the same time, it's very, how do you say, a process that is much less stressful than shooting, at least these days. Uh, the, the shooting that we were dealing with was completely different than it usually is. And now it's getting back to the editing and, and you, you just have time to sit with the material yourself. So it's something that I really, really enjoy at the same time as it's, it's mentally kind of challenging. Uh, so yeah, and I'm here in Göteborg. I'm like not far away from, uh, from this cinema. Uh, and walking there to the office every day and have a very uh, simple daily routine, basically. And you're editing yourself? Yes. Yeah. You're always I doing that? Uh, yes, yeah. I have, uh, uh, but I've also used uh, uh, help from editors. Uh, I've been working with Jakob Hultzinger, that is a Danish editor, and uh, uh, what I usually do is that I edit uh, the, the scenes myself individually, and then we put them together and, and we are working with the structure and uh, the in and out points of the scenes together. And he has a very good uh, feeling for, for the dynamics, to create the dynamics of the film. But, but individually it's very important for me to edit the scenes myself. I know m different filmmakers treat this differently, but how much do you feel that you are constructing the film in the editing room or you <coughs> you're constructing it beforehand? Um. I mean, I think that that is... Uh, uh, you have heard of horror examples when people have not decided anything when they are shooting sometimes, you know, that they are just filming, 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 and then they are hopefully going to solve this problem in the editing room. And I have tried to avoid that uh, because uh, if you have too many options in the, in the editing room, you don't really get any energy out of the editing. You have to have some kind of frames. Uh, so it's, it's very different uh, when it comes to how I have shot the scene. Sometimes the scene is very pre precise shot, you know, I decided exactly what's going to happen. And sometimes it's a conversation where I'm looking for some, some kind of energy or like some kind of, uh, for a certain kind of like uh, uh, feeling from, from the characters. And then, then I'm maybe, it's treating the scene a little bit more freely when I'm, when I'm shooting it. But, but, uh, but when I get to the editing, I always have a problem with these scenes because then you have so many uh, possibilities yeah. and I have just been in a, in a situation like this I've had a scene there where the actors were much more free and we were improvising a little bit more than I usually do and then going to a one single take shot where uh, we had a really precise scenario of exactly what the actors should do and it's so nice to get to these scenes <laughs> when you're editing <laughs> because then the frame <laughs> is fixed and you can just like trying to improve the scene um, uh, yeah but, uh, but you know, I have examples of friends that have had projects when they have decided, I will decide everything in the editing. They don't, they, 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 they don't even have decided what the film is about <laughs> before they start the editing. And then they have a huge problem when they are doing the editing. Okay. And uh, I, I think an advice to all filmmakers is, at least from my point of view, don't do that. Um. Great. Um, we will get back more to Triangle of Sadness, of course, later, and mm. um, also uh, watch a few um, images from your storyboard later on. Mm. Um, but f let's move back a little. Let's move back to uh, to the start, where everything started. Mm. Um, you grew up um, uh, here in Göteborg, um, outside uh, Göteborg on an island called Stysjö in the archipelago. And uh, this is also a place where uh, that's visible in many of your early films. Mm. What was it like growing up there? Uh, it, it, I, I liked it. <laughs> 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 I, I was actually, my parents moved out there in 1974, the same year that I was born. So they were new on the island and, uh, uh, and I was living in a house together with my father and my mother and my brother. 
which is eight years older than me. And uh, I mean, it's interesting to talk about upbringing and, and talk about the village that you come from, because it's hard to say how it really was, because you can't compare with anything, you know, like it was like it was. Uh, uh, but when I, when I, older I have got, I have understood also that people are looking at it in a kind of exotic way, that you live on an island without cars, or there are just a few cars, and you have to take a ferry to come to the city, and you're isolated in some way, uh, and it's very dark and stormy during the falls, and, and the summers can be very beautiful. And, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's like a childhood that has its ups and downs also independent, like my, my, my parents divorced when I was four years old, and then uh, that, wa that was probably a big part of my life uh, at, at that time. And uh, But the island in itself is also, yeah, you have this is your playground and if you go in that direction in, in, in 10 minutes then you then you will get to the ocean and if you go 20 minutes in that direction then you have the ocean so it's also a very uh, limited setup it's almost like when you're deciding i'm going to shoot the scene with only a single take you know <laughs> this is what we have this is where we can uh, what we can use when we want to play and have fun as a kid uh, so yeah uh, let's see if i move back there i don't know maybe <laughs> um, given your big interest in monkeys that has been evident in <laughs> your films yeah. um, I, I read that your mother um, was inspired by a chimpanzee mother br bringing you up is that true yes I, uh, she has said that <laughs> in an interview at least uh, it was something like that you know every time uh, a baby monkey falls the mother should help it lift it up so it gets up on its feet again uh, I don't know if it was, was a chimpanzee, and then um, um, and then step back, and then lift it up, <laughs> step back. At at a certain point, the baby monkey will slap the mother on the hand. Don't touch me anymore. You know, like um, uh, so. That's at least uh, the, the story she tells about it. Uh, <laughs> and you don't know. <laughs> I don't remember that at least. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, but she, she, um, both your parents were teachers, but mm. um, uh, your mother was also an artist. Was that important for you that she was an I artist? I mean, and both my parents were, were doing something. My father was very interested in photography, <coughs> and uh, my mother was very interested in, in painting. And I think it was, f f for me, a big part of my upbringing was, was uh, colored by that my mother comes from the very north part of Sweden, Haparanda, that is on the border to Finland. And she moved away from there when she was 19 years old and went to Lund, that is a university city in Sweden, <coughs> in the southern of Sweden, where, where she meets my dad and quite quickly get pregnant with my brother. And suddenly she realized, I will not go back to Haparanda again. And Haparanda and the southern part of Sweden is like very different, different atmosphere. Like the winters are very snowy. Uh, the, the sun doesn't go, come up really in the winters. And, and there's a smaller community where everybody knows everybody. And uh, uh, if I look at my mother's interest in painting, uh, she was always, you know, like uh, every day when I got into the uh, downstairs, we were sleeping upstairs and I got downstairs, she was sitting in front of these pictures that was like, uh, a bird's eye view on Haparanda, where you see all the buildings and you see all different people walking on the streets and it's the snow and she could point on every single person on that picture and tell me who it was and uh, tell a story about that person. And she always asked me, Come, can, you, can you have a look on the picture? What do you think? Is it something that you don't like? Is it something that looks strange? Uh, and she always brought me in and used me as a, as a third eye that she also relied on. And, and for me, she was giving me a little bit, I think she gave me, gave me some confidence to trust on my own, on my, on my, on my own in instrument when I was looking at these pictures. So that, that was really something that I remember. And she was like sitting in this, just a normal room, what do you say, fluorescent light in the, in the roof, uh, and just hours and hours and hours sitting in front of, front of these uh, paintings. And, I don't know how many of these paintings she did, but there's at least 30 of like this bird's view perspective of Haparanda um, with, the, with the summer, winter, Christmas Eve uh, and uh, processing these memories. And, and I remember she always said that, okay, when, when you and Marcus, my brother, when you are old and you have moved out, then I will move back to Haparanda. Yeah. Uh, but then when, when we were 
old, suddenly we got kids and she became a grandmother, so she, so she stayed on Stusha and, uh, but it was really a way of processing her, something that she was missing, I guess. And then my father, he was, uh, is dealing with photography, uh, was dealing a lot with photography when I was uh, younger. Uh, and, um, uh, but I think it's interesting when you look at the background, because then you realize also that the decision of the, the, the job that I have, that I became a director and so, it's not the coincidence. It's, it's something that you also inherit from the culture of your parents. And I mean, and not at least that they are, they are teachers, that they're coming from an academic background. Uh, but uh, my father's grandfather, he was one of the uh, uh, mecenauts, one of the one that started Halmstadgruppen. And, uh, and Halmstadgruppen is a collective of painters. There was <coughs> uh, surrealist uh, painters that was very uh, inspired by Dali and so on, and was the first uh, surrealistic uh, art movement in Sweden. And uh, uh, he, he told a lot of stories about his grandfather. My father told me a lot of stories about his grandfather, how how they have said to the members of this group, okay, you can fight as much as you want, but always stick together. Always like treat yourself as a collective. Inside the collective, you can like have different opinions and so on. But, but uh, when we are like talking about the, us as a collective, it's very interesting, in, important that we always talk about the group. And um, so they managed to get some kind of reputation by this, this attitude to, to, towards each other and towards always lifting up Every, every time they made an interview, they talked about the Halmstadgruppen. So by not only bringing attention to themselves, but also bringing attention to the colleagues. Um, and Would you like to be part of such a group? I think it's super important to try to, to strive for having a collective or a group around you where you, that you can get energy from. Uh, and, I, I, and I think it would be important to create, if like we want to have a Vital uh, a Swedish film life, I think it would be very interesting if, you can, if it can be a couple of these groups, because then it becomes almost like uh, football teams that are competing <laughs> with each other in some way. So, so yes, I, and I think I'm quite good in creating that collective around me, creating that kind of group around me. Um, but, but I can really see how many of these ideas that have been like how we should run platform production, the production company in, in Göteborg uh, that I have together with uh, a couple of friends. Uh, many of the ideas of how to run it also comes from, at least uh, when I think back, I, I, I see it like it comes from also these things that my father told me about, about Hamstergruppen. Yeah. So. But you consider your um, production company as a, like a movement or with some aesthetical ideas or in this way? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I would love it that it was a movement. <laughs> uh, but what, what happened for me and the directors that is in the same generation as me was that we started on film school in, in Göteborg, the one that I know. Uh, the directors that I know that we, we, we met in Göteborg on the film school in Göteborg, uh, today called uh, Akademi Valand mm -hmm. film. Uh, and at, we were lucky because there was a paradigm change in the techniques when we went to the school. Uh, like the small digital DV camera have just came and was affordable to, to buy also for consumers. And uh, I, mean, I remember the VX2s and the Sony camera. It's like everybody loved it. You know, it was like, it, it was great. And we were, of, of course, inspired of the dogma movement in their approach of uh, like uh, uh, using this technique and, um, and not being limited to super big budget and so on. And the school that we went to in Göteborg, there was a school in Stockholm, and there is a school in Stockholm that at that time was called Dramatiska Institutet. And they, they were like the, the expensive school that I could afford uh, to shoot on real film. And, uh, uh, and we had very limited budget, but I think that that was perfect for us at that time because we, we, we started to use the creativity and <coughs> started to use this new technique. So. Uh, I think I think it's something that is like 
that can make a certain kind of movement happen a little bit at least, even if it's not like the, uh, the, like the 60s movement in France and so on. But, but it happened something with us because it gave us some energy that we could use this new technique. So uh, it's great when you see there's an invention in the technique and you in some way can use it because that changes uh, uh, the language of cinema just as much as it comes a new director that have a, a completely different wish, uh, language, uh, uh, like image language or like the, to, to look for the, 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 the new parts of the technique that is possible to use. And, and we were lucky then and were in the school at that time. And, and that was like really the starting point for us. Uh, and I met Eric Hemmendorf on the school. I, I met my former wife, Andrea Östlund on the school. And I, uh, Axel Danielsson, Mikkel C. Karlsson. There's a lot of people that, that we work together today that uh, uh, had like uh, the meeting point in the school, even if we were in different grades. And we met Kalle Boman at that school that really became like a mentor for, for all of us in, in our collective. Um, so. And talking about cameras and uh, new technique, do you remember the first, your first encounter with uh, the video camera as young? The video camera. <coughs> yeah, but it was, uh, and that is also something that was like very, how do you say? Uh, a crossing or like a, uh, like this is where I actually decided that I was going to be interested in, in filming and so on. And it first of all, OK, I had a father that had given me like a small compact camera that I could take pictures on. And I saw that he was always doing it and so on. Um, but then on Stusche, there was something called Stusche Fritid that was like a, uh, how to say, communal uh, institution where we could go as as the young people could go and uh, have things to do on our on our spare time or when we were free from school. <coughs> so it was not only sports; it was actually this Sjöfritid. And at Sjöfritid, you could borrow a, a Super VHS, a Super VHS yes. camera, and an editing. <coughs> and and we we got like we just went there and you signed something and then you got to borrow this camera for free and. What we were doing was what we were filming windsurfing. We were very interested in like uh, action sport, as it's called today, like biking and windsurfing and things like that. And uh, um, we 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 spend a lot of time to to film these activities, and then we cut it together, and we could borrow that uh, equipment. And I th I think it was very very important that that. The luxury of us being able to do that made it possible for me to start to practicing uh, pr practicing this profession. Mm, yeah. And then your interest in uh, action sport brought oh you to horrible. Uh, hor it's a horrible. Category. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it, <laughs> it brought you to the Alps, mm -hmm. where you um, uh, spent several years um, mm. uh, skiing and filming skiing. Yeah, and. Um, and um, what encouraged you to do this? Uh, well, I was always following my, my mother up to Haparanda in the winters. And then there was a lot of snow there and I loved to be in the snow and uh, as most kids, I guess. And uh, I started to fall in love in skiing, in alpine skiing. I don't know why, really. It was just, uh, yeah, I don't know why. Um, but got very interested in it and and started to buy ski films and uh, uh, I, I was like ordering ski films on VHS from from the US from from a ski magazine that was called powder magazine you know <laughs> like you could see this ads <laughs> of this ski film and you uh, uh, you send the money in uh, in the envelope and send it over to the US and <coughs> you was waiting every day for this film to come uh, in your mailbox <coughs> and finally when it came and like you realize it was a different system so it was <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't watch it <laughs> so you had to like try to uh, get a new VHS player which was uh, like a huge uh, uh, obstacle at that time <coughs> Uh, but then I watched these films over and over and over again. <coughs> Sorry, but so I build up my interest and 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 uh, my how to say uh, dream world was like from watching these images of like skiing in powder and these ski steep hills and jumping these cliffs and and reading magazines about skiing mm. and. Uh, I decided very early when I was around 12 years old or something, as soon as I'm finished with uh, high school, I will work that summer and then I will spend my first winter in the Alps. So that was even much more important than filming skiing, which I started to do later on. Um, 
Yeah. Mm. And <coughs> you made two like proper films, um, uh, filming skiing that uh, is uh, that are available and also is possible to watch for the audience. Uh, I made during four during the actually. Festival four. Yeah, yeah, there are two yeah. m two included in the yeah. in the retrospective in the festival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Free radicals one and Free radicals two. Yeah. Um, let's watch a clip from uh, the first one of these. Mm -hmm. scene from Free Radicals 1. Um, this is an avalanche and uh, for me it's of course connected to one of your most iconic scenes, the avalanche in Force Majeure, even though the main character is not watching the avalanche but mm. is in it. Mm. Um, how, do you, how do you feel those two scenes relate to each other? No, they maybe not specifically this one. Um, I mean, this was a ski there that is called Erik Mosfeldt and we were skiing in a small village in Switzerland that was called Dysentist. And this was something that you always were scared of when you were uh, in the Alps and when you were in the mountains and you were constantly thinking about that this could happen. So it was something that was very present when you were when you were filming and when you were filming skiers that were skiing on a face for the first time because <coughs> that increases the danger of course if no one has skied there before and you are putting the first tracks because then you're cutting up the, the snow layers and then avalanches can 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 surprise you and, and, and oh you were very scared of this all the time. <coughs> and this was one of the most scariest moments that I have experienced because I was not sure that if he was above the snow or if he was under the snow when I you know, nice ski down to, to the spot in order to try to find him. Uh, luckily, he was above the snow. <coughs> but, um, uh, I mean, I think all these experiences that I had in the Alps, uh, to be in a ski resort, to be in the mountains, uh, uh, was something that when I later on started at film school and started to make fiction films, that I was thinking about, is there a possibility for me to use this experience, go back to that world and, 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 and look at it from a diff little different kind of perspective. I think at that time when I was filming the skiing, I just, I loved to be there and I loved to be on a ski resort, but slowly I started to get tired of being in a ski resort. There are such a artificial villages and uh, many of them. Uh, uh, so, so and, and I knew that I in some way wanted to use the knowledge that I ha uh, have about, about that world. <coughs> And I mean, an avalanche is spectacular. At the same time as you're scared of it, you, it's 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 one uh, fantastic to watch it and uh, look at it. Uh, and um, yeah, and the reason that I um, uh, how to say came up with the idea, it was a combination of another person's idea actually. But the reason that I that I ended up doing this as a <coughs> course in for uh, for Smyr was I was watching YouTube clips of of avalanches. And then it was a, a clip from a, uh, from a French ski resort, uh, and you saw a lot of tourists sitting on an outdoor restaurant on a terrace, <coughs> and uh, uh, they are watching an avalanche that is coming tumbling down a mountainside in quite far distance. And everybody's like cheering, and they're like, "Ooh, wow, beautiful!" You know, and the, the avalanche gets bigger, and the, the screaming gets louder, <laughs> and people are really like, "Wow, it, enjoying it." And then it was these three seconds when uh, the enjoyment goes ov over to nervous laughter and then like into to complete panic. And people are like, li like sc starting to cry and uh, starting to flee and starting to run away. Uh, and this avalanche, it, uh, it stops before the, the restaurant. So it's only the snow smoke they could see uh, over, the, over the terrace where, where people were sitting. But everybody's running away. And but 20 seconds later, they realize, ah, there was no danger. So they have to go back and sit down and continue yeah. at the lunch with their lunch again. And I think that I was like <coughs> fascinated by 
uh, how do you say, uh, such a dense moment when you had excitement, fear, and then you have to go back to a normal normal day. Uh, I love that these three different moods were so close to each other. And like the, the, the kind of embarrassment of people that have let go of their controlled civilized side then have to go back and eat lunch. Mm. And when I was thinking about this scene, <coughs> my first thing, when the first I did to uh, when we were doing Force Mayor that originally was named Tourist, was to have four different situations where you see like uh, a middle class, upper middle class families going on s uh, vacation in summer or winter or whatever. It was a ferry, it was a bus. Uh, and <coughs> that the small changes of like a ferry is not leaving and you're not allowed to go on the ferry is creating like a kind of uh, uh, an emergency situation for them. And they are trying to handle something that actually doesn't have any physical danger, uh, but, but that it's just changing the setup for them. <coughs> And um, uh, uh, so, but and I told a friend about this this film, uh, uh, Leif Edlin Johansson is his name. Uh, I told him about this film, and, and this is a method for me because I love to talk about the films that I'm doing with with all the different kind of people around me because they, you always get so got good input, and you're always processing the film yourself when you're trying to tell about it. And I told him about this film, and I told him about the scene in, in the terrace, and, and my idea was that it should be a family that is ex experiencing that, that, uh, that avalanche. <coughs> and he said, like, what if the father worms away? And I'm like, ah, there it is. <laughs> you know, I understood immediately. Okay, take away the three other stories. This situation with an avalanche coming, the father running away, nothing happens. He has to go back to his family, like, okay, it's going to be, it's the perfect setup. Now we can really investigate what, what, how the characters is trying to deal with this situation and, uh, yeah, and, and the shame of their honor, honor culture and uh, 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 trying to not lose face and all the things that I'm interested in, basically. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful scene and uh, it's a beautiful film and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Mm. But Back to your 20s, when a uh, uh, young Ruben Östlund was filming in the Alps and uh, started making some money by doing those films, maybe? And not really, but... Not <laughs> really. <laughs> um, but what was the moment when you realized that this is what I want to dedicate my life to? I want to be a filmmaker. Uh, <coughs> I, I, I think that at that time I, th I thought that I would dedicate my life to skiing. And there was a lot of, like, people in the ski resorts that then maybe have started hotel or be become ski photographers or are, have are making ski films even if they are like 50s or something like that. So there were, <coughs> there were role models of a, a certain kind of lifestyle that I, was, I felt was possible for me. But uh, uh, after a while, as I said before, spending all this time in the ski resort, it, like, it, I, I, I got tired of it. And, uh, but still, I love to f to film, and I love to edit, and I love to to do the films. Mm, uh, so I started to at that point, like I think it was '97, the first time I applied for the film school in Göteborg, <coughs> Academy of Film Film in school now, and uh, uh, I was not accepted. Uh, I I didn't even come to an interview. Uh, uh, and the reason that I know about the knew about this school was only because I had filmed some climbing in Göteborg together with a, uh, uh, a photographer that I went to the school. At that time it was photography and editing on the school. And I, that's why I knew about the school. I, I wouldn't knew, uh, know about it otherwise. Uh, and uh, after applying one year, I applied the second, uh, the second time and uh, then I came to an interview and, and uh, yeah, and I showed this, I showed the, uh, mm -hmm. these films actually. And, uh, and the, how to say the selection committee or the jury was like open enough to, 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 to think that it, yeah I had some experience and could could transform it into something else. So that's that's why I started to, to the film school. So I mean if I wouldn't have been accepted on Göteborg uh, Film School in, in Göteborg, uh, it everything could have gone in on complete different different path because when I came to to film school. I was not uh, specifically interested in film history. Uh, it, it, uh, I have not really approached uh, the idea about being a director from another uh, point of view than being a ski film director. So 
it was a, it was a complete new world for me. And during your time at Filmhögskolan, uh, Valland Academy, um, you made two um, beautiful films that um, uh, that both were pre premiered at the Göteborg Film Festival. Yeah. Um, and before we talk about those films, um, can you tell me about your first memories of screening your first films at the festival? What was it like? Uh, you know, it's fun because Okay, Göteborg Film Festival is like, th that's the first festival that was also in my, in my world. I didn't really know about the concept of, of film festivals when I, when I started at Göteborg Film uh, And people started to talk about uh, the film festival and uh, like Andrea Östlund, my ex-wife, she had been here since she was young. She had uh, worked at the festival and so on. So, so she told me a lot about it. And, and I remember going to this cinema uh, and experiencing the kind of atmosphere that happens in here when it's a premiere in Draken. I mean, it's a, it's a very spe spe special feeling when it, when it is one of these premieres here. So I, I, when I was screening my first film at the festival, you want to be in the, in the, in the center of the tension. <laughs> you didn't want to be on a small <laughs> screen like <laughs> Haga Bion or like something like that. So you were also a little disappointed, <laughs> you know, even if you were happy that you were screening the film and there were some other people there and you got some good, good comments, but you wanted to have more attention. So, uh, yeah, and when you were looking in the catalog, you was like, how does the image look? Um, you know, it, uh, <laughs> you were evaluating uh, the, the kind of attention your film in comparison to the other films. So, yeah. so uh, even I it was almost more stressful to have a film on the festival than not having a film on the festival. It was much, much <laughs> nicer to go here and just watch films and not being nervous about your own film. <coughs> uh, now you're the center of attention uh, yes, anyway. Finally. <laughs> finally. Um, those two films, in a, in a way, they are uh, two beautiful and very intimate films and very personal films. The first one was called Let the Others Deal with Love, um, uh, about uh, your friends, more or less. And um, the other one was called uh, Family Again. Mm. And um, this is about your parents. Mm -hmm. um, and it's your about your parents' divorce. Let's, let's watch a clip from mm. this film. Jag hade aldrig kunnat skilja mig från dig om jag hade fått välja. Jag hade aldrig kunnat det, alltså. Nej, men vad då? Du jag hade fått välja. Ja, eller jag hade aldrig kunnat göra det. Jag, därför att det var så smärtsamt va, och att bli ensam. Och att, eh, Nej, men det stämmer ju inte. För mig, jo, men för mig stämmer det. För Nej, mig men stämmer. Kanske det var ju så här. Nej, om man tänker efter va, så var det ju så. Att jag sa den dagen. Alltså, jag vill att, du, att vi ska fortsätta att leva tillsammans. Men då måste du se mig som din allra bästa vän. Så ja, var det. Ja. Men, jag sa att jag men samtidigt hade du ett förhållande. Du var det du som ville. Du, du bröt ju. Du, du jo, sa jag sa att jag skulle flytta. Du sa ju att jag skulle flytta. Jo, men Klasse, så här var det. Du sa ju att jag Lyssna skulle nu. flytta. Jag sa så här, att jag, jag vill inte leva tillsammans med dig. Nej. Om inte du börjar se mig som din allra bästa vän. Och sen, sen flyttade du. Och det var, var vi väl överens om. In till Göteborg. Och där skulle du bo. Och jag sa att jag flyttar inte tillbaks förrän den dagen du börjar se mig som din allra bästa vän. Du så var det. Jag... Nej, men jag sa att du, vi ska inte flytta ihop igen. <laughs> <laughs> Förstår du? Nej, men du så var det. Och då så åkte jag... Helvete heller. Så åkte Nej, jag... Jag... jag hade jag inte. Jag hade ju ringt... när men klass allvarligt talat. Sen när jag kom tillbaka ifrån den här parandra vi jag var där i sexet, då hade du träffat den här unga flickan. Mm. Och så sa du någonting som är belysande för hela. Nu skulle jag verkligen visa att jag älskade dig. Exakt det så. Älska? Jag skulle visa dig att du... Att att jag älskade den när du hade träffat den här unga flickan. Förstår du? Nej, jag Exakt inte. så sa du. Och det, det, var ju, det, var, det var som ett nötskal. Du såg mig som din, som din, som din mor. Ja, det, så så du kan man inte ju förstå. säga. Så kan man väl säga att relationen är färgad utav det. Det är ju en annan sak. Att jo, men jag klasse, ser det, jag menar, det, det var lite orimligt. Jag jo, men visst, fan, man kommer inte till sin man och säger så här. Att nu får du visa att du älskar mig för jag har träffat en ung man. Så det var dina parents många år efter... Um, discussing their divorce. How yeah, uh, how does this was like the 23 years after uh, the, the no, 21 years after the divorce, and uh, yeah. so and it was interesting to s to start doing this. In first of all, I can say this was also a little bit of a 
how to say, a trend in filmmaking at that time. I think also, once again, connected with the kind of technique that suddenly have uh, appeared, that you have a light-handed uh, DV camera with quite good quality, so you actually can be your cameraman, camera operator yourself, and you can create very intimate uh, situations when you are shooting, where you don't need a lot of other people, and, and you can point the camera towards yourself, basically. And there was a lot of films on the school at that time. I remember Jeanette Frank uh, was a director, a photographer and a director that made a film about her mother. And uh, I think all the students that were at the school at that time was very inspired by these uh, films. I think also Linda Westrik did a film that was, uh, that was a ca got a lot of attention when she was making a film about her father. Um, so uh, we were, how to say, uh, people were encouraging us to, to look for some content or something that have happened to ourselves and make that the, the topic of our films. And Joran Duré, that was the professor of the film school, he always talked about like, you have to look for your, like the, 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 the core of the pain in you as a human being and what is that? And, uh, 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 and uh, um, yeah, so, so, so I think this, this, this topic came a lot from the kind of atmosphere and the, and the topics of the other films that were in the school at that time. And I think that I was falling in love with the, with the setup. You know, my, my parents had been divorced for 21 years. Uh, now both of them are, are actually don't have a partner again. Let's bring them together and compare their version of the divorce. And then let's see, because I've always felt they, they really, really love each other. They, they, there are so many sides of them that really like the other person and they have never been able to let go of each other completely uh, um, and, and see what happens if they are starting to talk about this. And when I started to shoot this film, it was so obvious. You put on the camera, you ask them to start to talk about the divorce. They were 20 year, 21 years back in time immediately. And, and for me, it was just so interesting to watch that because of course, I only heard my mother's version about the divorce since I'm brought up with my mother. I, I mean, I spend uh, uh, time with my father every s uh, second weekend, but, but it was not like we were talking about these things. And, and my mother maybe had uh, uh, closer to these kind of topics and talk about these things. So, so I had heard my mother's version. And now I was looking at my mother and my father at the same time when they were talking about this and suddenly discovering it in, in from a new perspective. So. An interesting detail in the clip is where your mother turns to you and says, uh, is, it, is, is it difficult for yeah, you yeah. to hear it? And <laughs> you said, it's very good. It's, uh, it, it will be the film will be great or something like that. And yeah. <laughs> 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 um, um, and, but, but for you, was, was, was the film uh, an excuse to get your parents to talk about these things? Or was it uh, from, from the, was, was the, the, the idea come from this will be a good film? Ah, but uh, it, it was both, I guess. Yeah. Like, okay, this is painful to talk about, and yeah. and let's let's dig into it. Why is it painful? L like, what what is it opening up? What uh, that that like, you know, you're you're trained in a in a in a in a tradition that what is feeling painful, what is feeling strong for you, is also the the topics that will be the the interesting. Uh, uh, films to look at the interesting art, so that you have to go in that direction. So, um, but I remember after the shooting the film, and uh, that it was a feeling of okay, uh, I, I in, in much wider sense now I can leave my my parents' divorce uh, behind and like uh, uh, yeah, kind of therapy maybe, but. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a mix, it's always a mix. You want to do a great film, and it's good if you get therapy <laughs> at the same time, right? <laughs> um, what struck me when I watched those films uh, before this talk, your early films, mm. is that um, you're now famous for being a filmmaker who explore ideas and analyze social systems. But if you look at those films, also um, let the others uh, did um, with love, did with mm. love um, with your friends, your yourself are in the middle of film, interacting and yeah. um, being present and not mm. being like analyzing from a distance. Um, mm. Do you do you also see this uh, yeah, change sure. in your filmmaking? But I felt very much after making uh, family again, le familian, that uh, 
I didn't feel really that I had any like topics that was really, really close to me and that I felt like I wanted to explore it and opening it up. I, and, and, and I didn't feel that I want to continue with documentary because I didn't want to, you know, dig in an, an, another person's life in that way. Uh, so, so for me, I had been inspired of some filmmakers when I went to film school and that also made films in a very direct light way where they're approaching filmmaking and feature films not from an Anglo-Saxon perspective when you have a dramaturgy with a, uh, with a protagonist and antagonist, but much more wild films that was fragmentaric and, and just images. And so, so that, were, that were the point where I felt like, okay, uh, I want I want to I want to do films where I am like Hanneke, you know, like <laughs> it's a uh, or uh, Harmon Crean. These were the, like the the kind of or Roy Anderson. Mm. Those were the ones that were in inspiring, and that you felt like, uh, uh, yeah, I'd, I had great experiences watching their films, and. Uh, I, th I thought it was interesting with the kind of conversation that was going on both on on Hanneke and Roy maybe and a little bit Harmony Green like that they were considered uh, cold that they were considered like not loving towards their characters and I never felt that I, I felt something completely different I felt that their that their way of looking at them uh, even if uh, if the characters were doing things that we feel is not very sympathetic and so on. I felt a, 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 a loving look even in this distance and this this long way of like looking and not just uh, yeah not emotionally ev evaluating what the, what the characters were doing. So I was very inspired by some filmmakers and and this was probably the reason why the first uh, feature film I made looked in the way that it looked. Yes. Um, um after graduating from uh, film school with this film uh, family again, you founded together with um, producer Erik Hemendorf that you're still working with the your production company, yeah. um, um, Platform Produktion, and uh, that has been up and running for almost 20 years now. Um, I noticed something that um, Erik said when uh, in when founding this company. He said that um, Platform Produktion was going to make films that doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you also feel that? And <coughs> do you what what kind of films did you experience that was the was that were lying? Uh, I I don't remember this quote, but uh, uh, I think well what I remember from platform production was that we were looking at many of our friends that went to other production companies and started to develop projects on, on extern, external production companies. And these production companies were applying for money from the Swedish Film Institute and got like developing money for the project, uh, but the projects never happened. So, so you, you could see people putting in a lot of work in projects that never happened. And I think the starting point for platform production was that we want to decide when we are going to do a film or not. It's not someone else that is going to decide it. We are going to say to Swedish Film Institute, do you want to jump on the train because we are going to do a film? Okay, if you not want to be part of it, we are going to do it anyway. So kind of use the energy that you have was in the beginning where you like can invest this in a movie and you can use your friends to to be the sound guy. I mean, Eric was, uh, we started to work together because I wanted, needed someone that was taking sound on the shootings of uh, the guitar mongoloid. And uh, uh, so that's that's how we started to work together. And then, then we decided to start uh, platform production and <coughs> that was, and uh, uh, you were very like you look, looked a lot at films and you, you you were critical and you were you were looking at what was in the Swedish cinemas at that time and I think that if the feeling was in the Swedish cinemas it was not really used uh, the, the technique change uh, the films were still produced as they were produced in the 90s and the 80s so uh, we felt that they there, there's like a newer version more interesting version of cinema that 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 we could uh, contribute with and that we can also conquer a certain space in the in the Swedish film industry or the f um, yeah the attention like um, so so I think the approach was more for me it was much more punk you know it was much more like uh, 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 you want to, you want to provoke something because you feel that 
this is so conform, like it's everything looks the same. And I think that I was very in love with the idea of we had this uh, uh, film critics, uh, Nils Petter Sundgren, that was sitting in film and that was this TV uh, uh, program for films in Sweden at that time that he every week was sitting there and looking at, <laughs> at his different movies <laughs> and that he one week had to review uh, the guitar mongoloid <laughs> and it's going to be so different so uh, uh, he, sh he would not know how he should relate to it. <coughs> yes, guitar mongoloid was yeah. your first um, feature film and mm -hmm. it uh, really did provoke some people. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's watch the opening scene um, mm -hmm. of this film. So these are the first images of yeah. your first feature film, and it's about cultural sabotage. It's, <laughs> the, <laughs> it's the first. It's the yeah. first. It's um, what we're seeing is the maybe most popular TV show in Sweden, yeah. All Song in Skansen, and then somebody destroying, um, yeah. uh, destroying it. Yeah. Um, did you feel uh, this? Was this your feeling when you did the film that you? No, did but did I, 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 it feels like it works really well when we're looking at now. It's like well, what a fun way to start <laughs> a film. Like you, you take the most like how to say, uh, romanticized Swedish version that is like the the most popular TV program in Sweden and this uh, sing along program with everybody singing together and pretending that everything is just perfect, and at the same time it's a very how to say to fit into that audience, you also have to be very conform. You have to be in a, a very specific way. Uh, and just like, okay, now, now we're going to, to 
look in a complete different direction and you have this little boy that is 12 years from Göteborg and they are singing Stockholm in my heart, yeah. you know, like it's like about <laughs> uh, uh, forcing the audience to look at a different part of Sweden and, and then now we are going to lift every single stone and look what's <laughs> under it and everything that is not like you may would make up and, and like nice behavior where I'm going to give you everything <laughs> else. <laughs> so <laughs> it was fun to see the start. It's kind of smart, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, talking about starting films, um, your latest film, The Square, yeah. is kind of has the same start, actually. Um, yeah. with, with like this um, cultural product that is uh, breaking down yeah. with the statue. Um, did you think about this uh, relationship? Um, <coughs> I don't. I, I've never thought about that. that it's it's uh, similar, but uh, uh even though there yeah. is, is an accident, even here it is sabotage. But yeah, it's the, like yeah, exactly, the old exactly. forms collapsing, uh, yeah. old, old art forms collapsing. But when you when you're starting a movie, I mean, it's fun if you manage to s make a setup that is the audience is like, bam! Now I'm in it. No, yeah. okay. There's someone that wants to turn things upside down, or you you. Uh, you want to s you want to throw the audience into something that is unexpected. What mm -hmm. is going to happen here, and and in which way you are you are doing that is like it, it. It's fun to think about the start often. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then in the guitar mongoloid, there are so many um, strange images and uh, mm. um, uh, interesting and uh, things that are maybe sometimes difficult to understand why they are there. Yeah. Um, uh, why did did you make this film like that? <coughs> I think there was a, a way, way for me to approach in fiction movies. When I was making Family Again, there were some scenes that I showed for Kalle Boman that is uh, like a film nester in Sweden, like he'd been working with uh, Marie Louise Ekman and, and Roy Andersson and Bo Widerberg. And he was a teacher at the school at that time and <coughs> when I was there. And I showed him some scenes that I was filming with my father and I told him that we were, do we were taking it over and over again. And he said, well, you basically are working like Bo Widerberg is working with his, uh, uh, with his fiction film. So it's no difference between uh, documentary, uh, uh, how you approach documentary and you approach fiction. And when he said this, I was like, aha, so I actually can make fiction movies. I had never, this had never crossed my mind. I thought that fiction movies would be like a process that is completely different. And when he said it, then it's like, it was like a click. And uh, okay, so I can approach uh, fiction in this way. Mm. And uh, I, I had watched a movie that was called Gamma of Harmony Corinne that had a great impact on me, which was a fragmentary, very fragmentary movie where that starts with, with a tornado that is just turning things upside down in that little uh, like uh, village in, in the middle of the country of the US and then it's aiming the camera to all these different kind of odd personalities that is that is in that village. And um, uh, yeah, I think it was a great inspiration for me when I was doing this film and I started to aim camera toward like this authentic, un unpolished uh, people and, and situations that, that we uh, most of the time when it comes to, f to fiction movies is trying to cut out or leave, leave out. And there was one thing with uh, Alt song på Skansen, this song along, sing along program that was like on the program that you got when you went to the sing, sing along uh, uh, event. Then from one year to another, it was a, it's a on, uh, on the cover, it was a guy w uh, with a yellow cap that you could tell he had was uh, 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 handicapped in some, some way. <coughs> you know, I had a, a, a some kind of limitation in this function, limitation, I don't remember. Uh, but from one year to another, he was replaced with a blonde woman, uh, and suddenly he, they had paintbrushed him away, or like in Photoshop, just cloned him uh, away. And it was like also uh, like uh, like a certain kind of irritation that we are trying to protect ourselves from everything that is disturbing, or so it's like uh, let's go into everything that is disturbing, basically. And this film certainly disturbed some people. Um, it got some great reviews, but it also received a lot <coughs> of uh, quite harsh criticism. Yeah. Um, how did you feel? No, but we, uh, I think I would have been disappointed if it didn't go in that way. But uh, we did quite something quite fun with the DVD cover, because when you, when you rent a uh, DVD in the stores, then it was like the best film, the best Swedish film of the year, and there was like 
five, a couple of fives and all the fours that you, you got as a review. <laughs> and then when you get home and you're opening it up, then it says the, the worst Swedish <laughs> film of the year. And then it was all the ones <laughs> and the twos. So uh, it was also a way of trying to neutralize criticism and, and stand above it and, and not let that decide if you feel that you have succeeded with the film or not. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, if this film created some um, conversation and some discussion about film, your next film certainly did that a lot. Um, it was called um, Involuntary, mm -hmm. and uh, um, let's watch a clip from uh, that one. Hej igen. Hej. Jag lämnar mig då belåtna. Härligt. Eh, jag tror att alla kommer på plats, men om det är så att någon saknar någon så vill jag att ni säger det nu. Så vi inte åker från någon. Ingen? Nej. Bra. Eh, vi ska strax åka, men först vill vara busschaufför Henrik säga ett par ord. Ja, eh, jag vill bara säga att eh, varje gång som vi gör ett stopp vid den här rastplatsen så brukar jag gå igenom bussens olika utrymmen. Och eh, den här gången när jag gjorde det så upptäckte jag någonting väldigt tråkigt. Och för mig får ni gärna spela lite musik och show och kimma en aning men ha sönder saker på bussen, det kan jag bara inte acceptera. Det tror jag de flesta förstår. Vad är det som har hänt då? Vad sa du? Vad är det som har hänt? Ja, det är en grej på toaletten. Ja. Alltså det är någon som har haft sönder någonting på toaletten. Men det spelar inte så stor roll vad det är, men det funkar bara inte. Jag vet inte hur ni brukar bete er hemma, men om bor på den här bussen så får vi i alla fall följa vissa regler. Är det någon av oss som har varit på toalett nu? Toalett. Vad är det som har gått sönder då? Ja, det är inte så intressant. Det är en gardinstång som har gått sönder, men... Det spelar inte så stor roll vad det är, men jag vet inte, vi är ett litet familjeföretag. Alltså. Mm. Mm. Vi liksom blir personligt drabbade när någonting sånt här händer. Ja, vi fattar det, men liksom, vi har inte gjort någonting. Det är synd om era familjen, men ja. det är inget jag inte verkligen tar här. Det är inte jag nej, nej, nej. Nej, nej, jag vet inte vem som har gjort det. Jag anklagar inget särskilt, men jag tycker det ingår i någon slags normalhyfs att man vågar erkänna om man har gjort en sån här grej. Vi har inte ens varit på tro på. Vad fan säger du? Det känns ganska träffbar nog faktiskt när du kommer fram just till oss här, men... ja. ja, det är upp till dig om du känner dig träffad, men jag tycker det är, jag tycker det är dålig stil. Mm. Ja, det är dålig stil alltså. Det är upp till dig att köra bussen. Det är ingen idé att snacka om det på det här sättet. Det är... Jag tycker verkligen det är dåligt. Jag tycker att när en sån här sak händer så kan den som har gjort det komma fram och erkänna det för mig. Tyvärr så känner jag faktiskt att, att jag inte vill köra vidare härifrån först. Jag har fått veta vem som har gjort det. Ja, den här gången var det en gardinstång som gick sönder men nästa gång kan det lika gärna vara någonting som påverkar bussens säkerhet och då kan jag inte köra vidare. Så. Jag hoppas ni har förståelse för att vi blir stående här tills de kommer att prata om mig. In Sweden, many people talk about Norén Christmas um, mm -hmm. as like um, from the playwright mm -hmm. Lars Norén and how he uh, he imagine a Christmas in his place. Mm -hmm. And 
but nowadays you hear more and more people also talking about uh, Ruben Östlund situation. And mm. I think this is kind of started with involuntary and maybe specifically those scenes on the bus where the bus driver refuses to drive yeah. the bus before someone has uh, uh, someone has stepped stepped front stepped in front and mm -hmm. said I d I destroyed the thing on the, mm. the bathroom. Um, how, how, how do you feel about this, uh, people talking about Ruben Östlund situation and what was no. it that you wanted to create? With of uh, this course scene? you get proud when you hear that and I mean I think that uh, when you make the audience or the one that have experienced your film start to look at life in a slight different way and being able to discover situations in life in a slight different way because they have a reference from your uh, films, then that's exactly what art is about for me. That is like someone have gi gi given you a certain point of view that makes you experience life in a, in a, in a slight different way. And for me, like I, if I have talked a lot about Roy Anderson, that I think that Roy Anderson have made me be able to enjoy small trivial moments in life that is would would have passed by and I would never have noticed them if I haven't seen his film. So he widens my perspective and my spectrum of looking at, at life and uh, if if you manage to do that then people are referring to you then then that's beautiful of course in th this film is uh, has five uh, different stories or storylines mm -hmm. um uh, intertwined and um they're all in some way about the problem of being together as a group and yeah. how to act as a group um why did you um, want to do a film uh, with this uh, subject that has I been... Th th this came out of, maybe from the work of the Guitar Mongoloid, because the, the individuals or the characters in, in, in Guitar Mongoloid, they, they were relating to the group in a completely different way. They were not afraid of making a fool of themselves. And they don't try to keep the face all the time. And uh, then I started to think about situations where people were very scared of losing face. And... Uh, where you are very depend your be your behavior is very dependent on the group or the expectation that group have on you <coughs> and i started to look through you know like well look through you know you start to think about your life you start to think about stories that you heard of you you start to to from a thematical point of view started to uh, me and eric started to talk about what what kind of situations have we experienced where people are very afraid of losing face in front of of, of the peer group or, or uh, like, uh, like a bus journey or like a social situation where you start to do things in a different way that you want to just because of the expectation of the group. And for example, this one with, um, with the bus ride, it's, uh, it was like a, I, I, I probably was a teenager when I heard about this story the first time. It was a friend of me that told me he was going down to the Alps on a, uh, on a bus journey and he broke the curtain in the toilet uh, of this bus and he didn't think that much about it try to put it up but it didn't work really but he got back to his seat <coughs> and then they stopped at the Raststedt in Germany somewhere uh, along Autobahn and then when he came back into the bus again the bus driver was really upset and the way that he uh, pointed out you know the moment when you have two choices either you say it was me or you keep your mouth shut and that was like, a, that's a classical dilemma. You have two options or more, none of them are easy. Because if you're not, if you're saying it was me, it's going to be embarrassing for you. And if you're not saying anything, well, yeah, let's see what happens. Maybe it's <laughs> going to be even worse. And there was this moment when you have not said something uh, and the bus driver went over and instead of driving away and continuing the journey, he turns off the bus and he says, uh, actually, I will not continue before the one who did this confesses. And then you have a small, small window when you can say, hey, it was me. But if you miss that <laughs> window, <laughs> it's going to be harder and harder all the time to, to admit that it was yeah. you. And it was something just, uh, how to say, I could, you, you could relate so strongly with the situation. And, and uh, I think that all the different uh, uh, storylines in Involuntary is very, very simple. It has one starting point of when the snowball starts rolling and just builds up and builds up and because you have ended up in a dilemma and you, you, did, you did the wrong decision. Uh, so, um, yeah, and, and all of them comes either from my own experience, uh, they have inspired of things that Eric told me uh, or friends have told me. Uh, and, and it was something also, you know, to try not to look for the most dra dramatic events, to look for the trivial small events but we can relate the, to the mechanism in it, and we can also apply it on different, all different kind of human situations. So, 
I, I would say this is also maybe the first time that where I, where I'm like going into a little bit like sociology, you know, like you're looking for a setup of a situation that we can relate to and we can understand. Well, I would also have done that. And there are scenes in the film that is also completely like taken from sociological experiment in the film, like the Solomon Ash conform conform theory or conformity test or what's it called where you're pointing on which line that is yeah. the longest one and you have a collective or a group that is always saying the opposite and finally will change your mind you will start to point on the smallest line and the shortest line and say this is the longest one so it was really uh, like the the kind of uh, how to say power the group have over the individual and and uh, uh, in which way it affects us and uh, yeah I don't I don't know how much you can influence thi these kind of things as a filmmaker but your films sometimes get quite funny titles in France. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Force Majeure for example was called Snow Therapy and Involuntary was um had the ironic title Happy Sweden. Um <laughs> uh, do you feel do you feel that is something really Swedish about this this kind of mechanism or um is it just how the French look at it? I think that uh, the French, as soon as this, uh, it's funny because when the French are distributing a foreign language film in the in the French cinemas, then then they always want to give it an English title. <laughs> so and Force Majeure, I was like, it's great, it's a French title, you know. And they're like, no, no, it's not possible. We have to have an English title. No, but I mean, I don't. I don't like uh, either a Snow Therapy or Happy Sweden as titles on Force Mayor or Involuntary. But at the same time, I'm, I have full respect for the distributors that is fighting to get an audience to go and, and look at the, the films. And I mean, if they really, really believe in these titles and they are fighting hard for it, I can also say, yeah, sure, why you, if you believe in it, go for it. Uh, yeah. yeah, but... Um, uh and how do you feel about the title Happy Sweden in the meaning, uh, as an analysis of your film, so to speak, that is something Swedish about this? Um, uh, uh, yeah, maybe it is something Swedish. Uh, uh, I don't know. But, 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 but when my feeling was when I've been screening the films, uh, like in France, for example, and uh, I feel that everybody can relate to the, to the fear of losing face and, and, and they can relate to the situation, so... Yeah, yeah, and this was a film that so many people could relate to. It was a film that um, everybody was uh, talking about, and it was also a film that got a lot of praise and a lot of success. It was screened in Cannes, and it got like good bagger awards in mm. Sweden. And like, what was the point when you realized, hey, I'm I'm now a famous filmmaker, and I'm a successful filmmaker, and I'm not just some guy making <laughs> films. Uh, I remember, do you know, the joy of being accepted in Cannes was fantastic because uh, we had said when we started with the project, our goal is to be on Cannes Film Festival. And uh, we were using that as like something that is pushing up the bar and increasing our own performance and trying harder and harder and like also taking the right business connection in order to make this happen. We, we started to work with Filippo Bada there. Uh, has the production company co-production office we still work together so it was a, it was something that is it was an approach that was getting us out in europe and because we also understood the kind of movies that we are interested in we need to go on an uh, international arena because sweden is too small and uh so so it was actually um how to say a career decision and all at the same time also you know in Cannes, the movies that we were uh inspired of and the filmmakers that we thought was the cool ones, they were in Cannes, so we wanted mm -hmm. to go there. So, um, so when when you got the call, you know, like okay, you you have been accepted for the for the program in Cannes in in, in uncertain regard. I mean, I was walking on clouds that day. I remember I was in <laughs> Stockholm and we were doing the working with the sound with the, the, the sound mixer and. I didn't take the, the the subway that day because uh, I was on uh, uh, Kungsholmen. I was wor walking all the way to Söder, <laughs> and the feeling was like you were walking a little bit higher than the uh, and then the ground. And it was um, it was a, it was it was a very pleasant feeling to have a goal and then achieve that goal. So, and then. Uh, we was very proud when we were in Cannes, and <laughs> I remember we met the Danish industry in Copenhagen airport 
when we were uh, changing flight to go to Cannes. And the Danes didn't have a film in Cannes <laughs> that year. And we were like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, finally, like we, the Swedes are like cooler <laughs> than the Danes when it comes <laughs> to filmmaking. Uh, after Involuntary, you did two films about uh, crimes based on real crimes. First, the, the short film uh, Incident by a Bank and then the feature film <coughs> Play. And even though they are about crime, you, you have to stretch it maybe to call them Nordic Noir or something <laughs> like that. Uh, uh. But maybe you can call them true crime, I don't know. Um, how, d how, do how do you feel those... Uh, how why did you turn to crime? And why, why did how does these films, do you feel, relate to the um, traditional uh, criminal film? Well, uh, the first film that you're talking about then is called Incident by a Bank. That was a short film. And uh, uh, the reason that I wanted to make that film was because uh, me and Eric had an experience of being witnesses to a, to a robbery attempt. Um, and that experience in itself was so absurd and was uh, clashing completely towards the references that I had seen in movies. So when I was like looking at reality on the other side of the street and what was going on, I couldn't recognize reality. For me, it looks like no, something is completely absurd. Uh, this is this this it shouldn't look this way. So I realized when we were experiencing that thing that this all the reference that I had from fiction movie movies had really changed my perception of reality and made it much harder for me to really uh, react and act in a way that was the proper way of acting in that in that situation. Uh, I mean, I become a, like a complete bystander, uh, like uh, like n Eric asking if we should call the police, but I'm saying like, no, there's no reason. They were trying to rob uh, uh, Enk in Stockholm, that it's an uh, exclusive shop. I was like saying, no, 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 it's no reason because you know they have a button under the desk and they just push it and then the police comes. Something that I have <laughs> not a clue about, <laughs> but I have maybe seen in fiction movies and. Uh, so, so when, when experiencing this, I felt also that I want to give a reference of this event uh, to, 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 to that can correct also uh, all the images that I had seen that have created this wrong image in my head. And I, 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 this is not only me that have been interesting in this discussion. I was, would say that Kelly Bowman had talked a lot about like how cultural references are, are changing our perception on the world and changing our behavior, and espe especially moving images that is hard to, how do you say, separate from a real memory. Uh, and there are so many examples of how moving images actually is like pushing out our our real memories, our real reference of the world. For example, if you talk to Vietnam veterans today, um, most of their, uh, how to say, ideas about what happened in the Vietnam War have been exchanged of moving images they have seen and their own experience actually have been pushed pushed out of their of their reference bank. So when approaching like the uh, in, uh, incident by a bank, it was, uh, uh, it was fun to discuss these things. It was fun also to, to talk about why is our area as filmmakers important? Why is culture important? Why is uh, uh, the kind of references and how we portray, portray the world? Why is it important? Because it's also coloring people. It's also making peop changing people's behavior. It's going to change the way that they look at the world. And, and that kind of critical approach towards your profession is super important, I think. You should... At least you should be aware of that if you're creating certain kind of images of the world, you maybe are going to create this behavior. People are going to start to imitate this behavior. And there's like examples of it that I think is fun to talk about, and I've done it many times before, but Robert Saviano that wrote the book Gomorrah about the mafia in no Neapel, <coughs> he said that uh, uh, a couple of months after a Quentin, Quentin Tarantino movie had been released in the world, the young gangsters in the opera started to shoot with a gun on the side like this, like in the gangsta style grip. And the consequences of that is that it's very hard to hit each other. <laughs> so the shootout became much longer and much more bloody and the police had a mess cleaning up afterwards. So even if it's not really e efficient and it's kind of bad to, to try to aim towards someone like that, even if it's so irrational, People are imitating this, and I and I think we have we have to look at human being from that kind of perspective. Even how I irrational it is, we are still not being able to sort it out from our brain, and it still is going to affect our our behavior. Or uh, and 
we have to evalu evaluate what kind of images or do I want to give to an audience? Which kind of images do I think is lacking? Which kind of images do I think is needed? How do I add something to a discussion about something that is going on? Am I just, just, am I just, just playing on the cliches? Am I just using the same cliches? Am I just hammering in the same kind of scenario? Or are I, or, or I broadening the perspective for the audience? Um, and and what, you, and what you're doing in this scene is that you're you're <coughs> the, you're you're not following the robbery from up close. You're not. Uh, it's not uh, a big thrill to watch this film. It's not uh, fast cutting, or it's not. Uh, you're you're not even um, with the robbers. You're qu in a quite. You put the camera in uh, quite a distance, and yeah. you film it from afar. Uh, why? What does that create for you? Well, I mean, I think that. <coughs> I wanted to have a distance to it and not, uh, how to say, uh, an overview, to look at it from a sociological point of view, like look at human behavior, look at how we are relating to each other and the distance from, from, from the different characters. And in order also to, to, to try to create a true, uh, a more accurate and true, uh, how to say, uh, reconstruction of the events that I had witnessed, I, I needed to use the real time. Because I think that this, this thing that happened w w where um, me and Eric was the eyewitnesses, uh, maybe it was over in five minutes or something like that. that. And uh, with the real time, it's also interesting because guns going off is not going to be the most dramatic moment. It will be just as dramatic or uh, evaluated in the same, same way as everything else that happens when you have real time. So the, the style of the film became more like a surveillance camera that is just filming this street. Uh, and, and we made it into a bank instead. Uh, and uh, using the red camera, that was also like a, a using a new technique. And the red camera that was shooting in 4 or and 5K at that time, I think, but still we were only projecting maximum 2K. Uh, so uh, thinking of like, okay, maybe we can zoom into the digital negative in the editing and create all the camera movements afterwards. So the whole film was filmed with a fixed uh, uh, camera and then all the camera movements and actually cuts in the film is hidden uh, in, in pans and so on. So I, uh, the reconstruction is feeling like an 11 minute, I think, uh, uh, real time uh, event. And, and I wanted to bring in the absurdities that I experienced when I, when I watched the robbery. You know, the guns were going off and I thought that, like, n will not everybody stop and everybody <laughs> will look and people will throw themselves down on the street. But instead it was completely opposite. It was people, tourists coming closer with an ice cream in their hand and wanted to see what's <laughs> happening. And uh, me and Eric started to film with our mobile phones and we were, complain we were complaining a little bit that you can't zoom on the mobile phone. <laughs> at that time we couldn't do it at all. And there was so trivial things going on. And it was one moment that, I, that really, really was affecting me. And it was in the end, one of the robbers had been caught and he was pushed down on the street and he was laying with his face towards the asphalt. And he probably had a most dramatic moment in his life. And suddenly Eric and me is like looking at the watch, but oh my God, we have to leave because we are going to a meeting at Swedish Film Institute. And uh, do you find, do you know the way? Yeah, 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 sure. And we were just like 20 meters far away from each other, but we were completely two different places uh, in our life and in like the experience of everything that, that was going on at that moment. So it was, yeah, it was uh, 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 like a, strong feeling of everybody's playing the, the main character in our life, of course, and, and life will continue even if you, you uh, have, have ex just experienced this. You are going to deal with all the trivialities and all the bureaucracy and all the sad things that you don't see in the movies. That is what he's going to deal with now. And yeah. yeah, and you use some of the same uh, visual strategies also for for your next feature film, Play, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is also about a crime. It's about uh, a group of uh, young boys who, who are rob robbing another group of young boys. And um, let's watch a clip from this. Um, in this in this clip, uh, you're quite close to the characters, but usually you are, um, as in Incidents by Bank, f you see them from quite afar. But let's mm -hmm. watch the clip first. <laughs> Ja, 
akkor már. Hey, Egy kérdező primo bíl. Na? Kérdező primo bíl. Köszönöm. Csak bakkor lenni grék. Ja, de klart du får tillbaka det här tröjan. Se ut som en tjuv, eller? Jag kommer ihåg. Vad var det för helgen? Hemma. Du gick inte för mig nu, va? Nej. För min brorsa blev rånad och misshandla för den helgen. Han blev av med exakt en sån här mobil. Okej, men alltså det där är min. Du gick inte... Ta det lugnt, okej? Du vet att det är han. Du vet inte om det är han eller hur? Visa till din mobil. Ja, men vadå? Vet du inte? Visa till din mobil då eller? Men jag kan inte be om att bevisa här. Vänta, vänta, bevisa. Ja, men kvitto. Idiot, har du på dig kvitto? Men ta det lugnt, Abdi. Vänta, har du på dig kvitto? Ta det lugnt, okej? Det är värdelöst just nu då. Men du kan inte skrika på honom. Har han vet om han har gjort någonting eller? Döm honom inte i förväg. Eller hur? Shit. Fan, gå och döma vem som helst med en sån mobil här annars. Ja, det går ringa. Jag skulle ta vad jag. Okej, jag får den. Du har nog något annat bevis. Va? Ha? Vad sa du? Har, har du något annat bevis? Jag tror inte. Ha? Jag tror inte det. Vad ska jag göra då? Han var ett kvitto som bevisade att det är din mobil. Men det är inte för att han går runt med kvitto. Nej, men jag har sagt att han går runt med kvitto. Du tar det lugnt. Jag ser bara, är det din enda bevis? Annars går det till Abdi istället. Nej, vänta, nej. Vadå nej, du kan inte stå och döma honom eller hur? Bilder. Vi vet inte om det är han. Tror du är en idiot eller? Anna. Man kan bara ta bilder. Du kan du sluta eller? Hallå snälla. Du får döma honom i förväg. Ursäkta våra kompisar, de är. De är som de är. Deras temperament. Ja, temperament. Ja, eller hur? Då får ta det lugnt om du kan inte tala på med den här tyten. Du kommer aldrig följa med. Alltså jag kan ju säga till att jag var med och köpte den och så. Jag lovar, jag var med när jag köpte den. Nej kille, jag tror inte heller när jag har tagit mobilen alltså, men... Vi måste försöka lösa det här på ett bra sätt, så lyssna bara på dem, okej? Okay? Jag vet att det kan vara jobbigt och så, men inga precisioner man direkt vill lyssna på, men gör bara det nu, okej? Okay? Hej, jag pratar med min brorsa precis. Han är en bit bort härifrån, vi ska gå till den, vi köper mobilen för han. Han ska avgöra om det han ser inte. Jag vill inte följa. Vad sa du? Jag vill inte följa med. Vi har inte kodet. Okej, okay, du kan stanna i mobilen, jag kan gå till den. Nej, vad ska jag göra? Alltså, jag vet inte två alternativ, jag ser bara hela tiden. Abdi, ja, jag vet, men ta det lugnt. Okay, det är ett bättre alternativ, eller? Håll käften, okej. Okay. Vänta, vänta, är det enda du kan se, eller? Håll käften, okej. Okay. Nej, vänta, se något annat än mig. Men tyst annars, okej, den kommer inte hjälpa detta. Jag har satt emot. Håll käften, okej. Det räcker. Håll käften, okej? Okay? Tror ni vi kommer någonstans med att ni står här och skriker, eller? Tror ni de vill följa med om ni... Ja, men tyst! Tror ni de vill följa med? Tror ni de blir rädda för det, eller hur? Tror ni han vill följa med om ni står och skriker okay. på honom? Låt honom säga någonting annat. Nej, men då så håll käften låt honom säga vad han vill. Låt honom säga vad han vill annars, okej? Låt honom säga vad han vill. Tyst nu, okej? Jag snackar med honom nu. Tyst, okej? Vad sa du? Jag ska ni Idiot, han är rädd för er. Han blev det räcker, det räcker nu, okej, det räcker. Vad är det för en fråga? Det räcker, ja, det är en dum fråga, men det räcker, okej, det räcker. Låt mig snacka med honom nu, håll käften, okej? Vad är det för den frågan? Håll käften, sa jag till dig. Vad? Okej, Sebastian, lyssna här. Du vet Sebastian, eller? Ja. Alltså, kolla här, han är precis här runt hörnet. Det tar inte lång tid, ni vill inte ha bråk, vi vill inte heller ha bråk. Ursäkta, de förmedlar detta på ett dumt sätt. För det är jätteviktigt för honom eftersom det är hans lillebrorsa. Och det är viktigt för er också eftersom det är, jag förstår att ni blir rädda. Bara följ med och visa upp mobilen så att brorsan kan få kolla på mobilen. Då får du gå sen när han har kollat. Det är inte svårare än så. Sen är det klart, sen behöver vi aldrig mer prata med er och ni behöver aldrig mer prata med oss. Så so the scene is the start of a process that is a robbery but it's really long. Um, it's like it's turning to in some kind of game almost. Uh, where those five um, young uh, black kids are robbing these three um, middle class kids. And um, this is also your first film, your first feature that has uh, one long story throughout. Mm -hmm. um, why did you sh sh choose to make a film uh, like with one story for the first time in this story? No, but I think it's because of the content of the film that changes uh, the way that you are approaching it. Uh, as I said before, like uh, Force Mayor, I was thinking about approaching it with four different stories, but then, then, you, then you find a, a content or a topic that is 
when you put it into the feature film format, it's much better if you tell a single story. <coughs> when it came to play, then it was, um, uh, the starting point of play was that uh, Erik Hemmerdahl showed me an article about a certain kind of robberies that took place in the center of Göteborg in Nordstam Femmanhuset. That is a big, big mall in the center of the city. And uh, uh, these kind of robberies that the article was about had been going on for many, many years. And the setup of the, of the, uh, uh, the robberies were, were, were like really interesting because it was small kids robbing other small kids or uh, like 12, between 12 and 14 years old. And suddenly you have a situation where the young kids are walking around with a uh, mobile phone in your pocket that it may be uh, costing 500 euros or something like that. And um, in Nordstan, which is a, the melting pot of Göteborg, is a place where all the different city parts are getting together. So you have all the different kind of class uh, connections and things like that uh, meeting each other. It's basically one of the only places where you can see all the different kind of uh, socioeconomic groups that are uh, included in, in the area of Göteborg. Uh, and uh, the robbery... Uh, uh, took place with a rhet rhetorical trap. So the robbers were walking up to kids that they saw were new in the city, and maybe were there for the first or the second time without their parents, <coughs> going up to them and asking, what do you know what time it is? And the victims immediately feels like there's something strange going on, but they bring out the cell phone to check what time it is, and immediately when the robbers see the cell phone, they go, hey, where did you get that from? My kid ro uh, brother was robbed the other day. He had exactly a phone like that. So they create a problem that doesn't exist. And in order to solve this situation, they say, we're going to show the cell phone to my kid brother th that is just outside this mall on a, on, a, on a street. So we have to go there and show it to him. And if you have not stolen it, there, there's no reason of you to be scared. And then we, then they, he will just say it's not his phone and then they, uh, you, you can leave. And the robbers were also using characters like bad cop and good cop. So one of the robbers, they were actually how to say, uh, going stone, scissor, bag before to decide which role they were going to play in the, in the setup of the robbery. So one, one robber is playing bad cup and another robber is playing good cup. So immediately when the, when the victims were getting a little scared, then they go, hey guys, I believe in you, there's no, there's no problem, but you don't need to feel scared if you have not stolen the, the cell phone. And they also use things like they are saying, our kid brother is there, with our mother, so they're also like uh, pretending that it's like an adult that is over there in order to get these boys to leave, leave the mall and go to this little bit more, how to say, calm street <coughs> where, they, where they were robbed then. And uh, it was very interesting when it came to these robberies, they were going on for many, many years. And uh, uh, people were seeing that something was going on and they were passing by really, really close uh, because there was a lot of people in, in, in these malls, of course. Um, but still, it was very hard for the adult world to uh, interact. Uh, so it was almost like the kids' world were taking place on one level and the adult world were taking place on another level. And that uh, it was like a wild west for the, for, the, for the kids. And the interaction like the, 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 the adults that maybe could take some kind of responsibility didn't interact. And it was like the social contract between how you look at other kids was completely different uh, than, than, for example, when my parents' generation was b brought up. Uh, so it was a lot of these kind of aspects that were interesting. And then, of course, it was one aspect that, that really was the, the reason that I wanted to make the film, and it was that the, the robbers that was from the real events, uh, they had one thing in common, and it was that they were black. So suddenly it occurs a very an image that is very hard to relate to and very hard to talk talk about uh, like five black boys robbing middle-class boys or like white boys uh, in the center of Göteborg where basically it's like where these two social groups are meeting uh, and why is that image so provocative why do we have this problem talking about it and when when I remember pitching the film you know where every time I was pitching the film and I told about uh, the, the, the setup of this situation I could see in the eyes of the person that is listening that they get a problem and uh, um, uh, so so it was just something that we had hard time to verbalize we have a hard time to talk about this is that good is it like is it is it something that we have to need to bring up to the to the surface and and, and investigate why we have a problem talking about this 
But still at this point I have not decided to make the film. Uh, but I started to do some research. Uh, and I started to interview uh, victims. I started to interview some of the boys that actually were, were the robbers. Um, I interviewed police, I, uh, psychologists and things like that and s trying to figure out like what, what really had been going on and what the motivation was and so on. And I thought maybe in the beginning like, you know, that of course I understood that there's some kind of enjoyment in the play or the game that they are pushing up to controlling and, and um, uh, uh, and I didn't believe that it was only that the boys, the robbers, didn't have uh, cell phones, that, that they were poor and so on. And very quickly I got to know also that the, that the, the robbers they had got to know each other through a football team. They were playing together in a football team. And uh, uh, that the robbers also was very aware of how to use their skin color as an out outspoken threat uh, to, to the boys that they were doing the robbery. So, and they were talking about like, okay, like the references that comes from some culture and, and so on, like you, you could tell that it have made an impact on them and how they look on their possibilities and when they are fantasizing about the future. Like, okay, uh, I, I, I have this stigmatized skin color and then like what in which way can I fantasize about my, my future? I'm going to walk on poles, the, the, the bread factory and, and so on. Of course, it's also connected to where they are in the, in the city or maybe mostly connected to where they are in the city and which, which kind of socioeconomic part of Göteborg they are in. Um, but when I did this, did this interview with one of the robbers, he told me, very unspoken, we are very aware of how, how to use this and, and you immediately understand like what kind of impact these kind of, uh, how do you say, uh, images that they are meeting in fiction movies and media report and so on is also creating a, cir a circle and they, they are imitating a certain kind of behavior. And that was the point when I really decided I wanted to de do this film and, mm -hmm. and yeah. And but this film also, after it was released, it also stirred a big debate mm. in Sweden and uh, some people talking about that you were reinforcing this kind of yeah. stereotypes and uh, some people even call it racist, this film. Yeah. Um, uh, like now, when you look at back at this uh, debate, uh, how do you feel uh, about it now? <coughs> I think it's interesting because I think that the, like the left, I mean leftish people that believe in socialism and like a certain kind of idea about how you should approach problems in in our society. I mean, I I, I still think it's a debate that. Uh, uh, that there are preconceived thoughts on what you should think and what you should talk about when it comes to uh, these kind of socio-economic and immigration problems and so on. And uh, so uh, uh, I think still we have a hard time to talk about these things. And uh, um, I mean, I think that when I look at uh, the decisions that I made, that I made the film, and I, I still believe in that I uh, like, there's a motivation for me why you want to do a film like this and why you want to raise this question uh, and why you want to want to create something that is rather like exposing like the, the idea about the stereotypes and exposing a problem that uh, maybe happened because you also can do it in order because you care about the boys that are the robbers they're just kids like it's a it's a it's it's also taking their their motivation and history and so on uh, mm, for real and, 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 and like want to bring it up to the light because of, because of their, mm, the consequences for them. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's still interesting to talk about it and, and uh, but it was such a stigmatized uh, image this, uh, with, the, with these boys um, and, and it was so obvious to see that it was hard to talk about and still I think th we have a hard time talking about it. Yes, it's, um, what struck me when I um, uh, w w watched the film again and also read some of the articles that was written then is how the how the um, discussion on this topic has changed since then. Mm. Also, Na nowadays th this ki this kind of r of uh, robbings is mm. uh, very much talked about yeah. and it's very much like almost a symbol that is heavily used by the extreme right in in many ways, um, mm. bringing these kind of. R robbings and this kind of crimes up um 
Have you noticed this change in the discussion also? No, but I mean, uh, what happened when we started to make play and after the play was finished was that the Sweden Democrats were like one of the, uh, the players, like a politician party in the government. And so it was a lot of things that was going on at that time. And I think, um, I mean, I, I think that it have been also more uh, accepted to talk about what are the consequences of immigration, what is the consequences of having working force coming from other European countries coming to, to Sweden and which, which, uh, which group in our society is it affecting and how does it change things. And, and that even if it's not like this yet, I think that uh, the solidaric feeling you can feel, feel with people that is handling this problem and actually daring to look at it and actually daring to look at the consequences of, of, of we are trying to deal with this problem and understanding that there will it be a friction in our society when we are trying to do it, still doesn't say that we don't want to uh, make sure that we are trying to help them. Uh, but we have to take the, um, uh, the problem from not only from like, an act like a middle class that is living in a, in a part of the city that don't care about this uh, or don't have to handle any, any consequences of the, of, of, of the kind of uh, immigration politics or what we are doing. We have to look at it from, from the whole society and, and also... Uh, uh, and it doesn't mean that we is n it's not going to have a generous uh, immigration politics and uh, things like that. Um, and I think this discussion is a little bit, little bit more in the society, uh, uh, but still, yeah. It's hard. It's hard when it comes to these questions that have been so hard to say labeled as in this topic you should think like that because then you are left wing, or in this topic you should think like that because then you are uh, right wing. And if you if you don't do it, then suddenly you you, you are like uh, uh, breaking the, the expected con convention about this. So so you have to deal with a lot of other questions than actually talk about the uh, the, the problem in itself. Um, Does it hurt you that people have been criticizing you like in this way? No, uh, not really. I think you you're always stressed when you are in a like in 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 something that is going on in the media, and you are especially stressed when it's something that you don't uh, are in control of. And uh, and when it comes to the media landscape today, when journalists is writing articles about other articles, then all of a sudden the many people have not watched the film that is commenting on it. And so uh, that is stressful, of course, but I felt like we were very careful when we were work working with this film and the, the decisions that we made came from uh, a, a, a long, long research and talking to people that I have a lot of experience when it comes to these topics. Um, we really wanted to know exactly how to, to, to like label everything that we were talking about and, and, and the decisions that we made when we make it was very carefully done. So I, I felt that, uh, yeah, I felt that I was quite prepared of talking about the film and, and uh, therefore also you can handle the kind of uh, the debate that is going on in a better way. And after this film, um, uh, your next project was uh, Force Majeure. Um, mm. um, the film we have mentioned uh, uh, already, um, but this was also maybe your big international breakthrough in a way to another level um, mm. uh, that really made you uh, wor wor world famous. Uh. Um, uh, and this is a film about... Uh, um, uh responsibility about uh, fatherhood and uh, masculinity maybe um and it's a film about marriage also maybe maybe <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> about the nuclear family and the idea and expectations you have of the role of the woman and the role yeah. of the father in a nuclear family and yeah yeah um, um let's wa watch a, a short clip um uh, we mentioned already maybe the most iconic film from the scene where with the avalanche but mm. let's watch maybe one the other that this clip that is so much talked about and loved in this film which is uh, when uh, and the father in the family starts to cry a lot oh. yeah i också vet besviken på honom fan jag hatar honom hatar honom så jävla mycket och ja <laughs> jag, jag kan inte förlåta det han har gjort för att 
Han har gjort en massa andra saker förut också. Han, han har liksom ljugit. Han har varit otrogen. Jag, han är... känner. Han fuskar i spel när han, 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 han spelar med Harry och Fjärna. Att det var patetiskt den här personen är. Och jag... Jag kan inte... Jag kan inte leva med honom längre. Jag vill inte göra det. Det är inte bara du som är ett offer. Jag är för fan också ett offer. Jag är för fan ett offer för min instinkt. this scene now because I remember when when the film was finished and it was um, uh, one of the uh, distributors that was like connected to the project was like okay this can be the end of Ruben's career as a filmmaker this is going this 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 film is going to be everybody is not now he's not going to they were they were very very provoked of this scene when he's crying and being pathetic in that way uh, in that way and that Thomas the character is like a person that is you know being uh, ridiculed ridiculed or like uh, and uh, that he, he believed that is okay now Ruben have made his last film so it's fun to think back on that that these kind of images that is unexpected or maybe mm -hmm. disturbing in a way or uh, uh, they are actually the, the small edges that makes a, a film get the quality that, that makes it last yeah. uh, and but at the same time when you're working with it and people maybe want to make it uh, like cut off these edges and, and put it into a place where you can just relate to it to other movies because it's uh, uh, hard to see what new kind of expressions that actually is going to work with an audience but uh, but then you are you're trying to to make it look like everything else that you've seen before so um, I think why this scene is also so loved and mm. uh, despite uh, those initial hesitations, it's uh. also because it's so funny. And um, uh, how I would ask you, how do you, how do you work with funny? Um, and, and how do you work with humor in your film? Uh, you have a structure for that. Well, I, I, I think that the approach that I uh, have is, is kind of similar as uh, stand-up comedy in many ways, that you are trying to look for a situation that the audience can relate to uh, that is uh, easy to identify with but hard to handle like a dilemma once yeah. again like you're looking for a setup where all of us can understand oh my god how would i behave if i was in this situation and then from that starting point you can push the the actions in a certain direction even to an absurd situation like this and and still make it believable uh, you can bring the audience on or my own feelings because that's what it always starts with of course do I believe in this or not is this possible for me what does what does this scene highlight when it comes to the context of what the action comes from so <coughs> uh, and sometimes you you, you manage to, f to find a situation where kind of absurd behavior actually is possible for the characters mm. but but always have a, a starting point where is it relatable do i believe in it and uh, uh yeah the more the, the the more an interesting a dilemma is i mean like that 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 or in this setup i actually can relate to the absurdity that of what the character is doing and what he's deciding to do um, and uh, the the better it is like in a comical approach uh, to get it but i always love like scenes and films where where the, the the humor is is like one step before the audience so 
uh, I get kind of provoked when I see humor that is pointed out too obvious to me because then I feel like, mm, come on, I'm an intelligent person, you know, uh, I'm not stupid. And, I, and, I, and, and when you have the kind of humor that, that you're one step behind and you understand, am I allowed to laugh about this or am I supposed to feel sorry for him or, or is, it, is it like life that it's, it can be both comical and tragical and, uh, and, uh, and absurd at the same time? Uh, it, it, it's interesting because this kind of this kind of approach to a content it it, it feels that it's kind of hard to to do it. It it the agreement of the audience is so often very very obvious. This is funny. This is sad. This is important. Yeah. And and to to leave that evaluation to the audience in itself like w do you think it's funny do you think it's tragic <laughs> like it, it's up to you to decide it and uh, in many ways uh. after in this film force majeure you um, uh, made your uh, latest film um, uh, the square mm -hmm. which uh, won the palm door in in Cannes. beautiful price of course and it's a satire of the art world um, and <laughs> it's about this uh, artistic director who is uh, running uh, an, uh, a museum. Mm. And this, I wanted to ask you, this museum is placed in the Royal Castle yeah. in, in, in Stockholm. Um, I wanted to start with asking, why did you choose this uh, Royal Castle as uh, the <laughs> environment for this uh, <coughs> museum? Uh, we were thinking a lot what kind of museum it should be in the film and uh, I was going to some of the art museums in Europe, the modern art museums, the contemporary art museums, and most of them look like MoMA uh, in New York, like a, a modern building and uh, yeah, this white cube where you have the exhi exhibitions. Uh, and uh, um, But then at one point I was in Stockholm and I still hadn't decided what kind of museum it, it should be. And n not too long ago I had been in Versailles and, and looked at the, the museum and the castle in Versailles. And when uh, I was walking to a meeting with Kalle and Erik and, and Roy, we were just supposed to have a dinner together, I was walking past the Stockholm castle and the idea came like, isn't it fun <laughs> if it, it's like the monarchy is over in Sweden and they don't know what to do with all these old uh, castle buildings and they have decided to make it a museum of contemporary art that is also the case of Versailles that they have parts of it that they use for contemporary art so it was like a, 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 a fun setup of taking a symbol value of Sweden like that is for the royal family and uh, then build an extension modern extension and put yeah. it on the, uh, the royal castle in, in Stockholm and I asked Jack Wingård, that is uh, uh, one of the more famous uh, architects in, in Sweden, to can't you build an extension, like, like a modern extension, and he did that. So it, <coughs> it was a fun way of playing with the symbol value when, when the museum became like a, a comment in itself. But monarchy is not over in Sweden, and uh, you uh, recently received the, the King's Medal yes. from the King. Yeah. Um, uh, how many of your films did he had, had he watched, do you know? Uh, I think he said that he prefers Steven Seagal, <laughs> <laughs> something <laughs> like that, <laughs> which is, I don't know if it's, it's the young man fun or not, but uh, uh, he, it, I mean, I think that is interesting though, you know, like, okay, because when I was in, uh, in LA and when you get nominated for best foreign language film or best, best international film that it's called today, then you get invited to a dinner uh, at Sony Pictures. Uh, and uh, the reason that Sony's pictures have this uh, dinner is because before, back in the days, the, the, the directors that came from abroad and came to the Oscars to, to uh, go on this uh, Oscar gala, mm. they got a ticket to Disneyland and then they went back home. Like they, they didn't uh, meet their colleagues in the US, so Sony wanted, uh, wanted to like build connections between the European and the US directors. And... Uh, when we were having that dinner, we were sitting around this table and all the different directors from these different countries, they wanted them to tell what kind of problem they have had with the film because of the lack of freedom of speech in your country. 
And it was all these different kind of versions, of course, some of them had problems with this. And when it came to me, you know, like, okay, so how, how can you, what problem did you have of, of telling this topic in your country? And now, like you, as we are bringing in, we are giving you freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. so it's a very, like, interesting approach to what they had to Europe and, and the countries. And I was like, you're saying, you know, yeah, uh, well, in, in Sweden, I, I actually have, have uh, like, used the royal castle and, and, and the, the royal family is like, uh, 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 <laughs> that was before I got the medal, but <laughs> it, it, they have no problem with it. And they, 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 they I, I am, um, I, I, w I think I was invited to a dinner at that time, like, at the castle and so on. So, and I in the US, they did, like these people, they really didn't want to hear this. They didn't want to hear that there's, a, that there's no problem with freedom of speech in Sweden. They, they wanted to s like l be like the, the nation of the one where here we actually can talk open about everything. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, in Sweden <laughs> you get a medal if you're provoking <laughs> the, the, the royal family or like trying to do something convert controversial about the uh, royal family. And this film, I think it, it's a quite complex film in, in the way that it's both quite um, uh, satirical um, and uh, ridicules the art world, mm. but in the same time, uh, I feel such a fascination for the art world in the film. The way the, you, the way you go into the all the details in the museum, all the you, you how you portray all the little parts of the museum. Mm. Um, how, how did you feel about th this? The art the world in, uh, in general. No, but the, the system that you are portraying, the, like the uh, art world system that you are portraying I mean, I with think such uh, joy still as you're being uh, satirical about it. Well, I think that the art world, uh, the, the, the biggest problem with the art world is probably the, the same kind of problem that you have in a film festival. And it is how do you make the audience look at the art from the right perspective? How do you make the audience experiencing the art? And, and uh, the conventions of an art museum they are so strong. You walk in and you look at an object that is placed on the floor, or and uh, uh, it, it the, the exhibition in itself is really the big challenge of art, I would say. So, uh, <coughs> I mean, I think it's interesting that when you're doing something about art, where every that there's like an approach to it that some people are like getting very how to say hurt that you actually are criticizing the way that they are uh, displaying art. And, and, and uh, um, uh, I, I have no problem to, to, to feel that someone is trying to attack the film world and the kind of conventions that we are dealing with, because of course, when you get some criticism, it's a possibility to step up and do it in a different way when you can, when you can approach these, these problems uh, and so on. So, yeah. It was quite fun to make that movie about the art world. Uh, yeah, because it created a lot of strong <laughs> reactions. <laughs> um, let's, let's watch a scene from, from the square. Um, um, maybe one of um, the best scenes I've ever seen in Swedish cinema with mm. a man portraying an ape. Mm. <laughs> So this is once again a scene about somebody breaking the conventions yeah. and uh, creating a new uh, new state in the room, so to speak. Um, how did you come up with this scene? Uh, from the beginning, it was inspired by uh, American punk rock artist that is called Gigi Allen, as a Gigi All In. And I had seen some of his performances on from his concert on YouTube where 
he's completely anarchistic. He's like he's doing everything that is forbidden. And the audience is coming to his shows also to participate and getting closer to him. But it's dangerous to get close close to him because if if you get clo too close, you can get a punch in your face. And like, and there's one YouTube clip that you can check out if you want to. That is called Gigi Allen live in Boston or something like that, where his performance is creating this kind of energy in the room when the when the audience actually are really really scared of him and, uh, and there was something about like the the uh, how to say uh, he is breaking completely all the, the the social contracts that that you build up when you are on a stage or just build up with the other human beings like it didn't matter if it was women there he was beating them up He'll, no like like no like living up to the man of be role of being a man and you be nice to them and will you let them be so no it was like a complete anarchistic element that was like completely wild and um, I was also inspired of a performance artist uh, that was having a show at uh, Färgfabriken in Stockholm uh, uh, where uh, Oleg Kulik is his name. He was playing a dog uh, from one performance uh, that he did. And it was actually a sign next to him where it says, beware of the dog. And he had a big chain around his neck. And people that didn't respect this, he attacked them. And I think the, the whole show ended that he bit the curator's daughter in the leg and so they actually had to call the police <coughs> so uh, and I, I I think I w was like okay interested in like to put a kind of this kind of character into a room where everybody is dealing with a very fancy dinner you know when you're trying to realize which spoon and fork or knife should I use when I eat this dish and all of a sudden someone comes in and, and breaks that social contract and the film, I mean, the square in itself, it's, a, it's about an art piece that is maybe bringing up questions a little bit about bystander effect. And the, the, the whole scene starts with a, with a voiceover that is telling, soon you will be confronted by a wild animal. Uh, as you all know, the hunting instinct is triggered by weakness. If you show fear, then the animal will sen sense it. If you try to escape, the animal will hunt you down. But if you remain perf perfectly still, without uh, showing, uh, like, uh, without blinking or showing any fear, then you can hide in the herd, safe in the knowledge that someone else will be the prey. So it was trying to highlight that the bystander effect comes from also that we are the fact that we are herd animals. So when we f freeze and we don't know what to do, it's not because we don't want to take responsibility, it's basically because we we are scared and, and we, we hope that someone else will be the prey. <laughs> <laughs> um. Except for dealing with the art world, this film is also quite a um, tender portrait of the uh, relationship between the father and uh, his two daughters. Mm -hmm. And th and you are also a father of uh, two daughters. Um, mm. uh, how personal is this uh, a portrayal for you? Mm, no, but I, I think... Yes, of course. It is uh, based on how I relate to them and also Christian, the way that he brings in them to their to his work and showing what they are have as an exhibition on the on the museum at this point and, uh, and the way that I uh, are trying to bring in my daughters to to my work and uh, the girls in the film is also dealing with cheerleading and I think it was fun because they were approaching cheerleading. My daughters were approaching cheerleading and started to start with cheerleading and I had all this prejudice about this sport. I was like, why do they look like small sex symbols and like what, what is it with this? And when they, but when they started to do it, I saw it was a sport where it's like really a, a team sport where they're working together. All individuals are important, but the collective is super important also. And it made them very strong when it comes to relying on that they have a group that they are, they are have as a secureness in their in their life and they also became team players by doing it i, I love that they were doing this sport and that's why i uh, there's a lot of ingredients like that but it's hard to say that there's i mean all the sides of christian is of course inspired of things that i can relate to and that i feel i'm like i have experienced myself and also the other characters as as usual when when you do something and <coughs> Let's move on to your new film that you mm. are working with currently, Triangle of Sadness. Um, uh, then you have moved into the fashion world. Mm. But before we go into the uh, maybe what the film is about, um, 
can you just tell me a little bit about the process? Because, because this film was quite uh, hit by the COVID crisis, right? What happened? Yes, we, uh, first of all, we had to postpone the shooting because we had problems financing the film. Uh, I mean, it's a great thing to win the Pandora, but what happens after Pandora is like that you're building an air castle that is bigger than, <laughs> than uh, uh, like the expectations. So like all the, uh, all the people that are approaching you, all the people you're talking to is like help, helping up to build up this air castle. And we, we had a film that we know was like kind of wild. I mean, it starts in the fashion world, goes to luxury or then ends on a deserted island. And I wanted a multinational cast, an international cast that is coming from all the different kind of countries. So it was a hard film to, to finance. <coughs> but finally when when we managed to finance the film and the, the, the shooting was starting in Göteborg in February last year, basically a couple of days before the sh starting shoot, you know, you start to hear something about the virus that is in, in China and it's, it's moving closer to, to Europe. And uh, uh, we try to block this out and not think <laughs> too much about it, but it was just coming closer and closer and closer. And at a certain point, we realize we are not going to be able to finish the first part of the shooting because we have to we have to have a break. Yeah. Um, uh, so it was like, of course, a stress moment that you all the time had to relate to that maybe an actor would not be able to come into Europe uh, when we started the shooting again. I mean, there was uh, occasions where Woody Harrison was standing on the airport in LA and was not allowed to to enter the flight. So the producer Eric had to have been on on his phone and trying to convince <laughs> them that we have a, we have a paper that is allowed to work in Sweden and all these kind of absurd situations that of, of course in increases the stress for the for 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 the production and uh, um, and of course when you take a big economical risk it's it's even more increasing the stress. Um, and we, we managed to hit the, the, the second wave of the <laughs> pandemic also <laughs> <laughs> during the shooting. So we were extremely unlucky. At the same time, we have been very un, uh, lucky because we did over 1,061 COVID tests uh, during the production wow. and we didn't have a single one that was positive. Uh, so we managed to, to keep a little bubble, bubble when we were working together. And, and so at the same time, I must say it was have been one of the most enjoyable shootings I have done because everybody was working together in such a beautiful way. And it was like those small friction parts that maybe happens on a, on a production. They never happened because people were leaving this out. The, uh, we didn't have like time for focusing on, on tr trivial problems and everybody was working in, a, in, a, in the same direction. Uh, so, but, but you know, it's it's like a new, completely new setup that you are trying to relate to. Uh, so you also feel like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not in control. And and when when you are a director, the worst thing that happens is, of course, if you feel like even if I'm if I have the right setup and I'm creating something and it's not playing out how I want it to play out, then you feel completely <laughs> struck by it and guilty. But this is something that I'm not in control of, and then you also I I can let down my guard and. What will happen will happen, you know. Great, and um, you have brought some images from the from the film yeah. and some sketches. Um, but before we start looking at them, maybe you just say a few words uh, of uh, the <coughs> kind of give the outlines of the story, so we know yeah. what we uh, are about to dig into. Yeah, but I uh, the first approach of of the film is because my wife is a fashion photographer, so she's when I met her six years ago, she started to tell me a lot of things about like uh, the fashion industry and uh, uh, the beauty industry. And uh, I thought it was interesting to look on how beauty becomes a currency. So if you look on the different aspects of being able to climb in a class society, you can say that money and education is very important, but beauty is also an aspect that can make you climb in class society. And maybe if you look, uh, look at the society we live in, then it's something that conventionally more is used by women, that you marry rich and using your currency with the looks uh, like the trophy wife idea. And um, but when, it, when you start to look at the fashion industry from the male model perspective, it's happened something very interesting because the male models are paid maybe one fourth of the what, what the women are paid. They are uh, one of the few uh, uh, professions where men actually is making less money than, than women. And they also can use the, the currency in the looks and the sexuality in order to open up doors. I, I, uh, there are possibilities in that industry to do that. 
but at the same time it's a very very short career so your looks are fading away and you're not going to be active for many years but you have been used to a certain kind of lifestyle and the fall back and not being able to live that life is going to be kind of harsh for these people and the women they in the industry they can have a, like a kind of approach to this i'm going to be a trophy wife so i will like i will marry rich and then i will get out of this lifestyle so that kind of like satirical cynical approach that they have to the profession in itself i thought was interesting so what i wanted to do was like to take the uh, look at the uh, the currency in in beauty and youth and look at it from three different kind of worlds first in the fashion world and then we take the two main characters, that is this couple, the male and the female model, to a luxury yacht. But unfortunately, the luxury yacht goes under and, and billionaires and models and a cleaning lady from the yacht is flushed up on a, on a beach of a deserted island. And suddenly all the hierarchies are gone. Um, and it turns out that the, the cleaning lady knows how to fish and to make fire. So and and she ends up in the top of the hierarchy so the, it's the hierarchies are flipped and now comes the, the the interesting question what will then the male main character call do with his beauty currency will he use it in some way or <laughs> <laughs> what will be the what will be the ways that he's going to use this currency so that's basically like the 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 setup great um so le le let's look at the the pictures and then we will get some um uh, unique insight to your process also yep. by watching them what we're watching here is uh, the images from the storyboard of uh, triangle of sadness uh, how are you working with the storyboard in your process well i mean i have done this since force major basically that i'm trying to to um, paint storyboard pictures that I think is, is catching the, the essence of the scene uh, that I'm working with. And uh, uh, what I do is uh, basically that I Google images that is from uh, the internet. And when I find the right body expression, I use it and do the outline or the figures and, and uh, work quite long with it. So each and single storyboard image that I'm working with, I put a couple of days or maybe a week or something like that. So, so it's, a, a, it's a process that uh, is going to demand some sta stamina from you. But what, why I thought it was interesting to show this is, I mean, when it comes to working with a content like a, a, a feature film, that is, you get an idea, you get interested in the idea, and then it takes three years or something like that before you actually are going to express what you think about this idea in this visual medium. Uh, uh, you have to find a way of tr keep your interest on the content. And when I'm doing these storyboard uh, pictures, just that it takes a long time is making my mind uh, always brought back to the content of the film, brought back to the idea about the film, how I should work with the film. And maybe I come up thing with things that is from these different scenes, but I also uh, come up with maybe completely different thoughts and, and something else. So, so for me to use these images is a way of like a writing process, but but even more meditative. So I, it's like more of of uh, of of, a, of an unexpected thought that comes to me when I work in this way. Mm. But um, uh, and yeah, and then you can see also on the images that that sometimes you feel like ah, we really managed to capture something, and you can see the result of that we have made in the film that they are that are quite similar, and uh, but we have that we have actually tried to copy the storyboard image. It's not always like this, but the most important part is find something that draws your attention and and keeps your attention for many many hours because that that's a really good way of getting up to uh, with ideas uh, when it comes to the project. Yeah, th these are quite striking images. Uh, if you look at the first one, for example, um, um, w um, what is it that we see? You know what is with this image? It's actually w the first time th when the project got postponed and we didn't get the money that the American financiers had promised us. I was so <laughs> angry at them. <laughs> and I was like, fuck this American system, you know, when you always say yes, 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 until you're writing the contract and that's when you're starting to do the business deal and all of a sudden it turns out that they, they're not going to say yes anymore. And I had like a really like, uh, anger to that <laughs> like the, the American <laughs> film industry in many ways uh, uh, even if I understand that it's a different culture and and I, I I wanted to start the film in a much more aggressive way when I when I got this feeling and I, and I wanted uh, the male models to do this costing and 
do this preparation for going on the catwalk when they have the speedos with the American flag on them and you have these assistants throwing paint on them like that really in an aggressive way. So the, the scene was really created from when when I when I was very very disappointed, <laughs> and it, it gave some energy to the film also. And, and, it, uh, and as you can see, it's um, uh, the um, uh, when you see the still from the f from the film, mm. um, uh, how how, how does it correspond to the what you thought before? Uh, no, I mean it's. Uh, uh it's uh, I it's basi basically a copy of yeah. the storyboard <laughs> picture. I don't, I, uh, and that, but it was kind of fun to shoot it because these young men that is playing the male models, they they are very vulnerable when they're standing there. They're it's cold in this room, and and they are throwing this paint, and you can see the how they react when they get the paint on them. So, uh, uh, and for me, it also felt like a good approach to opening the th the third film when you basically are aiming the camera towards the man. You know, like in, in Force Majeure, then it's Thomas, in, in, in the square it's Christian. And the third time now we're aiming the camera towards the man and how the man is dealing with the con contemporary times and, and all the questions that is in the air. And, and, and you have these men going up like this and they like to <laughs> throw in paint <laughs> on them. And yeah, uh, hopefully it, it, it will, will bring in the audience in, in a good way to the, the film. There are also some um, beautiful um, pictures from the yacht. Mm. Um, uh, how was it working uh, to shoot on a on a boat? Well, we we had a shooting of the yacht in two different parts of the shooting. One, we had a studio that we had built in Trollhättan. Uh, we were working with Film Vest, uh, where we have built the interior of the yacht on a big, big gimbal, the way where we can uh, tilt the the whole room, like basically 20, 20 degrees. Uh, because uh, there's one scene that is taking place in a storm where everybody gets very seasick. And uh, uh, so we, we were working in a studio set that is basically the most beautiful studio set I have ever seen. It's Josefine Åsberg that is the, uh, working with the, um, uh, the scenography, the, the art department, uh, and the set design. And the detail that she did the interior is, is very impressive. I, I would like to everybody to have a look on that when they see the finished film. Uh, so, so parts of it we shot in, in the interior, in, in, in the studio. And then the second part we shot on an exterior on um, Chris, uh, Christina uh, O is the yacht called. And it's, ba it's Onassis' old yacht. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, an older generation know who, who Onassis was. He was one of the richest persons in the world at that time. And it was like the the creme de la creme of, of, of the world's elite that was invited to come to his yacht. It's like Churchill, Marilyn Monroe, Kennedy, uh, Maria Callas, all, all these people that was part of the Western elite at that time were invited to, to this yacht. And we're going to blow it up. In the film, it's <laughs> going to be blown up. Uh, and that's basically the end of before we get to the, to the deserted island. So now you're in the middle of editing this film and uh when, is, when will it be finished? Um, from the beginning, the, the goal was to finish it in, in May for Cannes uh, this year. Um, but well, during the circumstances with COVID and so on, we don't even know 100% when, when Cannes will take place and which form it will take place. So, so right now I'm in, a, in an editing process when I can decide the pace of the editing quite much myself. Um, but still, in, in the back of my head, in May is where, where we are aiming for, but, but it's great if we can edit longer. For me, it's a luxury to be able to edit for a longer period, of course. Uh, so I'm sitting by myself with a laptop computer, mm, uh, yeah, enjoying the material and, and yeah, trying to, to have an open approach to the material and realize really how I can use it in the most efficient way. Um, in, the, in these days, so many films are postponed and they are uh, not released. And how, 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 how are, are you nervous about how, if, if it will be possible to release the film in a good way during uh, this year? I personally, I don't go, I don't walk around and be nervous of circumstances that I can't control. I just don't have that approach to things. Uh, so no, uh, I. I uh yeah, I just feel like, OK, we have to adapt to the kind of world that we are we're deciding that we want to release the film. And I think also it's not only that, that OK, 
it can be a window where you decide to release the film when it's getting a lot of attention just because it's one of the first film in this kind of category that people have been longing for or so on. So, uh, yeah, there are, there are worse problems in these times, definitely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so thank you so much for um, coming and uh, talking to me and it's been wonderful listening to you and uh, congratulations to the award um, and uh, don't forget everybody at home to um, watch all of Ruben's film at the retrospective that we're presenting during the festival. Thank you very much. Thank you.